Okay, thank you very much. This is my afternoon look. Um, <clears throat> so this is an excellent time to give this portion of the uh, meeting talk because uh, you've heard very polar views of what Lyme disease can be, basically the idea save you on the one hand, and then the view of uh, physicians from ILADS and other organizations on the other. So I think I'll start by doing a quick review of the IDSA point of view of Lyme disease, and it's shown on this slide with the famous title from Gina Collada in the New York Times that Lyme disease is hard to catch and easy to cure, and basically saying that Lyme disease is rare and occurs in limited locations. Lyme disease is easy to diagnose. Testing for Lyme disease is very reliable. Treatment of Lyme disease rarely fails, and chronic Lyme disease does not exist. And that is pretty much a summary of the IDSA guidelines, and that's kind of why we have a problem. So first of all, you've seen this slide before. This is the number of cases of Lyme disease in the US, which has been rising tremendously over the last 20, 30 years. The CDC recently instituted a new diagnostic um, algorithm where they had definite and probable Lyme disease cases, and that has actually increased the number of reported cases. Uh, but the number of cases is still probably about tenfold less than the actual number of Lyme disease cases. And the CDC even admits that their surveillance testing, which they use, misses a significant number of Lyme disease cases. So this is a, a problem that the CDC has yet to address. Now, you've all seen pictures of ticks in different stages, and you've seen pictures of Borrelia rising out of the soup here, like the Loch Ness Monster. Um, what you haven't really heard much about is the, the reservoir hosts for Lyme disease. And you've heard about mice, and everybody knows about mice being reservoir hosts. But there are a number of other animal species that are very competent reservoir hosts for this disease. Some of them are shown on this slide. This actually happens to be a, a western fence lizard, which has an immune system that kills Lyme bacteria. And that at one time was thought to be something that would protect all of California from Lyme disease. However, it turns out that California has 22 other species of lizards, and they are all very, very competent hosts for Lyme disease. So if your tick happens to find this lizard, then you don't have to worry. But if it finds one of the other 22 species, you're in trouble. Um, this very ugly creature you saw a picture of before. Anybody know what that is? Shrew, very good. William Shakespeare. Shrews are very good hosts for Lyme, and they're very competent at transmitting Lyme disease to ticks, Lyme bacteria. Uh, fortunately, there aren't a lot of them. But what there are a lot of, at least in California, is this creature here, which is the western gray squirrel. And it turns out that in some parts of northern California, as many as 50% of the squirrels are now infected with Borrelia. So this is becoming a significant host for this infection. What about this picture? And you thought Lyme disease was only a deer problem. This is a rock python from Southern California that has managed to get infested with lots and lots of ticks. And I always think of this slide, you know, when people say, well, only 1% of ticks are infected with the Lyme bacteria. Well, that means if you have 100 ticks on this rock python, one of them is probably get, you know, transmitting Lyme disease and getting it infected or get, picking up Lyme disease one way or the other. So um, what about deer? You heard a little bit about deer. These are my kids chasing after deer in Yosemite National Park a number of years ago with a very nervous photographer running behind. Uh, deer have become a real problem in terms of Lyme disease because they're not infected with Lyme bacteria, but they're kind of like the mass transit and bed and breakfast for ticks. Ticks like to ride on them and go very long distances. And deer are a problem because at the turn of the last century, in the year 1900, deer had been hunted to the point where there were only 500,000 in the entire United States. However, at the turn of this century, the year 2000, the deer population has grown to 35 to 40 million. And if this is the mass transit for Lyme disease, it's doing a great job of getting those ticks all over the place. Uh, birds, you saw this picture before from Dr. Sperling. Uh, they can harbor ticks. Um, this is a study from Dr. Scott showing the bird population, songbirds in Canada. And the results of the study were that songbirds import beaver door free infected, infected ticks into Canada. And because songbirds disperse millions of infected ticks across Canada, people and domestic animals contract Lyme disease outside of the known 
an expected range. So if you're trying to say, well, here's a place where there's no Lyme disease risk, you can't really say that because there might have been some bird flying by that dropped off an infected tick. And that's one of the problems with this disease. We don't know what the risk is, really, in any given area, including here. Dogs, I like this slide because, again, it's like the snake slide. You know, if there's like 100 ticks on this dog here, uh, chances are one of them's got Lyme or isn't picking up Lyme disease. Um, and the interesting thing is when we look at the dog infection rates across the U.S. versus the human infection rates, there's a huge disparity. So, for example, let's take Colorado, which is right here in the middle. So in Colorado, there were, in 2000 to 2006, there were 998 cases of Lyme disease in dogs, almost 1,000 cases of Lyme disease in dogs. On the other hand, how many cases were there in humans? One. So you know that there's something wrong with that type of reporting. Either there's too many dogs who are getting infected, or there's too few humans who are getting reported with Lyme disease. And that gives you probably a better idea, if you look at the dog infection rate, what the true human infection rate might be. So what about the clinical features of Lyme disease? Now, you heard about the EDM rash. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, that part of the presentation got sort of cut out. But um, staging of Lyme disease is based on these clinical features. And there, you've heard that there are different methods of staging, such as early localized, early disseminated, late Lyme. I kind of like this method, which is basically just saying it's acute or chronic. Acute Lyme disease being less than one month from infection, chronic being greater than three months since infection. Clinically, this is a much more useful definition of Lyme disease than what's included in the IHSA guidelines. And I'll tell you why a little bit later. So what about classifying Lyme disease? Well, you've heard about the hard symptoms of Lyme disease, the arthritis, swollen joints, the Bell's palsy. Um, but there are basically two types of Lyme, maybe three types. One with predominant musculoskeletal symptoms, which are basically fixed arthropathies and myopathies, or more commonly migratory arthropathies and myopathies, which are really unusual in medicine. Usually symptoms don't migrate, they kind of stay in one place. Lyme disease is different. Symptoms migrate. And the other type is predominant neurologic symptoms, where you have cranial neuropathies, meningitis and encephalitis, unexplained cognitive defects, like you heard in the last talk. Um, this type of uh, dichotomy is actually very useful when you're evaluating a patient clinically uh, for Lyme disease. There is also um, the cardiac uh, aspect of Lyme disease. Interestingly, in California, we don't see a lot of patients with cardiac disease. It's much more common on the East Coast. We don't know why. Probably has something to do with the strain diversity. But there are these symptoms, including palpitations, arrhythmias, pericarditis, and heart failure. Uh, really only arrhythmias with AV block are considered hard symptoms of Lyme disease, but these other symptoms are quite common in Lyme patients. Now, what about um, diagnosing a tick bite? Well, when you see a tick like this up on the screen, you know, anybody can see a tick like that, right? But what about, what does it look like when it's on you? Well, can anybody see the tick here in this, on this arm? It's right there. I can make this thing to work. <laughs> well, it's right here. That's an infant tick feeding on this arm. So people often don't recognize ticks when they're attached. And they may not recognize it, especially if they're places that are hidden, like behind the ear of this young girl and in her hairline. Uh, you might miss the fact that this, this patient had a tick bite. So the statement that no tick bite, no Lyme is a little bit deceptive, because if you don't know you had a tick bite, you might think that you had no Lyme. So that's a problem. What about joint symptoms? Arthritis, swelling of joints is a classic symptom, as you heard from the IDSA guidelines. But here's the problem with all these classic features of Lyme disease. So first of all, only 50 to 60% of Lyme patients recall a tick bite. Uh, for the bullseye rash, the arthritis migrants that you saw before, only 35 to 60% of Lyme patients ever see a rash. And the rash has a variable appearance, so people may not recognize that it's an EM rash. And then in terms of the arthritis, only 20 to 30% of Lyme patients get actual joint swelling. Uh, and this may be masked by taking anti-inflammatory medications that keep the swelling down so you don't really recognize that there's any problem with the joint. So what do we see with chronic Lyme disease? And this comes from a number of studies that have been published over the last, oh, 
30, uh, 20 years, uh, looking at symptoms in patients who had documented Lyme disease. This is a study by Nancy Shattuck, who basically looked at the entire population of Nantucket that had Lyme disease at one time or another, and she contrasted those patients with controls from mainland Massachusetts. And what she found was that every single one of these symptoms on this list was significantly more common in the Lyme patients than in the controls. And with the exception, perhaps, of palpitations, that was only borderline significant. But all of these soft symptoms like fatigue, poor coordination, headaches, memory impairment, concentration problems, word finding problems, difficulty sleeping, joint pain and swelling. Interestingly, if you look at joint swelling, only 23% of these people, the Lyme patients had that, whereas 61% had joint pain. But the swelling was still significantly more common than the controls, where only 7% of patients had joint swelling. And that actually is the rate of arthritis in the general population. So Lyme patients don't have a huge amount of joint swelling, but it's significantly more common than controls. And then muscle aches, weakness, numbness, neck stiffness, all of these are symptoms of people who had Lyme disease, but were allegedly cured. Now, more recent studies have looked at this again in other places. This is from a study from Scandinavia. Again, malaise, fatigue, pain, memory problems, concentration difficulties, paresthesias, all significantly more common in uh, Lyme patients than in controls, with the interesting exception of pain. And it's not really clear why that's not more significant, because pain usually is very common in Lyme. But this was a population that had a lot of pain, probably because it was from an arthritis clinic. And so it was not exactly the best population to compare the Lyme patients to. But you can see there's an increased rate of these symptoms. And then another study uh, from a group here, again, looking at these kinds of soft symptoms, all of these significantly more common in patients with definite Lyme disease and probable Lyme disease than with historical controls. The one symptom that was not more common was seizures, and nobody in these groups had seizures. And probably based on that uh, fact, these authors concluded that treatment failure after appropriately targeted short course therapy for early Lyme disease, if it occurs, is exceedingly rare. So again, you have to define your symptoms when you say that what, what Lyme disease is. If you're just using the hard symptoms, like in the IDSA guidelines, you're not gonna find that a lot. But when you see these softer symptoms that occur in clusters in patients with Lyme disease, that's what defines chronic Lyme disease. All right, so what's happened with chronic Lyme disease? Because chronic Lyme disease has been a dirty word in some uh, corners of the medical profession. In other corners, it's sort of what the happening thing. Uh, this is a study from Fader and colleagues in the New England Journal of Medicine that defined chronic Lyme disease as a diagnosis for patients with persistent pain, neurocognitive symptoms, fatigue, or all of these symptoms, with or without clinical or serologic evidence of previous early or late Lyme disease. So basically, they're defining this as chronic symptoms, but without the IDSA version of Lyme disease. And that pretty much is what chronic Lyme disease is. It's all these other symptoms without the hard signs that IDSA requires to make a diagnosis of Lyme disease. And what's happened with this definition is that in Europe, it's kind of been taken up at least on a narrow basis for neurologic Lyme disease. This is a study from Norway comparing the clinical and laboratory manifestations of chronic neurologic Lyme disease and showing that, in fact, you can use this <coughs> definition to define a subset of patients who have these symptoms and have neurologic impairment. And of course, their conclusion is that this is very, very rare. You hardly ever see this. It's not really something to be concerned about, but it does exist. And that's always the beginning when you want to define something that's significant. Now, in contrast to that, the ILAS working group is, is formulating a working definition of chronic Lyme disease, which is shown on this slide. I don't have time to go through this, but it will be incorporated into the next version of the ILADS guidelines, which are a grade-based um, of document, and it will give a better definition, a more specific definition of chronic Lyme disease. So, here's a question for you. AIDS testing has a sensitivity of 99.68%. Lyme disease testing has 46% sensitivity based on a number of studies. So could we be missing the diagnosis of Lyme disease? And I think most of you would probably agree that we could be. And I don't really have time to go through the studies that are the basis for that statement, but they're in the handout if you want to look at them. 
Um, and then the question becomes, so all these patients who have these, this constellation of symptoms, is this post-Lyme syndrome, or is it persistent infection that's causing these symptoms? And in order to understand that, we have to go through the pathophysiology of Lyme disease. This is why I got 40 minutes to talk. And I'm convinced that someday we will all dress like this. <laughs> so, so the characteristic of Borrelia burgdorferi are really very are fascinating. First of all, this is a, a spirochete that has over 1,500 gene sequences. Not the most of any bacteria, but it's an awful lot of genes. There are at least 132 functioning genes. Actually, now we're up to, I think, 160. In contrast, Treponema pallidum, which is the agent of syphilis, has only 22 functioning genes. So again, a much more complex organism than syphilis. As many, Borrelia has as many as 22 plasmids, which is three times more than any known bacteria. Plasmids are these extra chromosomal pieces of DNA that are kind of rapid response agents uh, that can produce uh, proteins in response to stress or other factors. And so th what this means is this, is that this organism has a mechanism to respond to different environmental changes very rapidly, which again implies it's a really bad actor. And finally, there is a certain, there's something that's been called stealth pathology by which the Borrelia evades the immune system and also antibiotics. Now I'll go through this fairly quickly because I don't have a lot of time. So this is the, um, the cartoon of the Borrelia genome. There's a linear chromosome here at the top and then there are a number of circular and linear plasmids that contain the major um, genes of the bacteria. Um, interestingly, when you look at genotypes, and you heard a little bit about genotypes, the genotypes of Borrelia found on the East Coast are very different from the genotypes found on the West Coast. So on the East Coast, there are four genotypes, K, A, B, and I, that make up 80% of the pathogenic Borrelia. However, on the West Coast, and keep those in mind, KABI, this is from a study by Bob Lane. These are the genotypes that make up most of the in, uh, uh, infectious bacteria here. As you can see, there's only, I think A is the only one that's on here. So very different makeup of the genotypes on the West Coast and the East Coast, and it makes it hard to compare Borrelia in those two locations. So what about the pathology, the cell pathology? Again, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but there are four basic mechanisms for this, namely immune suppression, phase and antigenic variation, physical seclusion and intracellular and extracellular sites, and then secreted factors. And this is from an old paper by Monica Embers before she was doing her monkey work. Um, so basically, this cartoon shows the stealth pathology with downregulation of outer surface proteins, hiding in the extracellular matrix, and then immune suppression by things like complement inhibitors. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through this in great detail. This is a nice little cartoon of tick saliva and how it also suppresses the immune system. So ticks are really fascinating creatures. And the saliva is something that initially allows the Borrelia to get into tissues and disseminate in a very quiet way so the immune system doesn't even notice. A very interesting mechanism. Uh, phase and antigenic variation shared with other organisms such as trypanosomes, HIV, and other bacteria. Uh, physical seclusion is in intracellular sites, and here we get the formation of cysts, which I'll talk about very briefly because Eva Shabi is going to be talking about that as well, and maybe Dr. McLaughlin too. And then physical seclusion in extracellular sites involve biofilm formation, which you're going to hear a lot more about in a minute. Um, there are also secreted factors from Borrelia. Originally, it was thought that Borrelia did not secrete anything, but now we know that there are a number of secreted factors that are involved in invasion, tissue invasion, and persistence of the organism. So what does all this mean? Well, it means that this is a really nasty bug. Um, so uh, I don't think we're all going to express like this. So let me just say a word about cysts and biofilms. Um, uh, Cysts and biofilms, cysts have had a problem because there's a terminology problem with cysts. They've been called different things. For instance, they've been called spheroplasts and L forms in cocobacillary organisms, but they've been called cysts or round bodies in spirochetes. But then there's been sort of crossover terminology, and that's been very confusing. Um, cysts kind of look like this there's a bunch of bacteria 
encased in a wall, kind of like that. And this type of cyst can persist in tissues and hide out for a long, long time. We can evade both the immune system and antibiotic treatment. And we know that Borrelia forms these cysts, so that's how it can survive over the long term. And we also know that treatment with things like doxycycline, which is shown here, this is a study from Ava Shapi, uh, doxycycline will actually decrease the number of spirochetes, shown in blue very nicely, so it looks like all the Lyme is dying, right? But if you look at the round bodies or cysts, they're all increasing with the doxycycline, and that's how the bacteria is escaping the treatment. And here is a mechanism of how this infection becomes chronic and escapes antibiotic therapy through cyst formation. Biofilms, again, I'm not going to talk about this because you're going to hear about it from Dr. Shafi, uh, but this is something more recently discovered in Lyme disease. Um, what the problem with biofilms is that there's no uh, treatment uh, agent that treats biofilms, that can break up biofilms that we have now. But we do have some candidate, um, uh, <coughs> candidate form, um, uh, agents on the horizon. And these are aroid and alkaloids that are derived from sea sponges. And there's a group in North Carolina that's working on this as a mechanism of breaking up biofilms. And here's some preliminary work with uh, Staph aureus and E. coli. Uh, this is uh, the Staph aureus with just antibiotic. This is with uh, just an antibiofilm agent. And then this is with both agents. And you can see that you get a clearing of the culture to here. So it suggests that these may be useful agents to break up biofilms, but again, we don't really know if we can use them in humans. So, um, treatment of Lyme disease. Um, treatment of Lyme disease is about as controversial as Lyme disease itself. And to talk about treatment of Lyme disease, you have to talk about treatment failure, which was first reported in 1989 by Priyak Mersik, who found that antibiotic therapy may abrogate the antibody response to the infection, but Bieber-Gorfri may persist, as shown by positive culture in MKP medium. However, um, in spite of this early finding, there was a statement made in one of my favorite medical journals, the New York Times, uh, by two prominent members of the IDSA, who said that there is no credible scientific evidence for the persistence of symptomatic Borrelia burgdorferi infection after antibiotic treatment, and actually I think that was also included in the IDSA guidelines. So credible scientific evidence. I think Dr. Sperling mentioned that there was a huge literature on tick-borne disease. And if you want to know exactly how huge, there are over 25,000 articles that have been written about tick-borne diseases. And that is a huge literature for one disease entity. So in these 25,000 articles, there must be something about persistent infection, don't you think? And it turns out there is. So let's start with animal models, which would be mice. Uh, there have been a number of studies in, in mice uh, and other rodents, like gerbils and hamsters, showing that um, isolation of Bieber-Dorfri from different organs in gerbils six months post-infection dem demonstrates that Borrelia persists in these animals for a long period. Despite the ability of hamsters to develop a substantial amount of Borreliocidal antibody, Bieber-Dorfri can still be isolated from hamsters 16 months after infection. Now, hamsters don't live that long, so 16 months is like the equivalent of four years in a human. So this is an organism that persists. Same thing in mice. These are studies in mice, and I won't go through all these, showing that there's persistent infection in spite of antibiotic treatment and more recent studies. Uh, showing that there may be persistence nine months after treatment, and also a uh, failure of five days of treatment in mice infected with Bieber-Dorfri. And more recent studies by Dr. Bartold's group at uh, UC Davis, showing that um, tigacycline and ceftriaxone treatment in mice can also fail. And then, and I guess I, oh, I'm sorry, that's, that's it for mice. So a lot of studies in mice that treatment may fail to get rid of Lyme disease. What about dogs, our best friend? Well, this, uh, uh, this information comes from Straubinger's group in Austria, showing that dogs may also fail treatment for Borrelia. Um, um, at, at, at the end of 500 days, for example, you could find Borrelia DNA at low levels in multiple tissue samples. There's been some controversy over whether Borrelia DNA means that there's active infection, but I think that's another subject for another talk. 
monkeys. Uh, well, we got some monkey models. And in some of these by the Cadavid group and Mario Phillip, uh, of early Bergdorferian infection and rhesus macaques, mirror several aspects of both the early and chronic phase of disease in humans. And also, there is some evidence that neuroborreliosis is a persistent infection in this non-human primate animal model. And then um, more on the monkeys and persistent infection. And then the most recent study by Embers uh, showing that, um, that infection in rhesus macaques of Borrelia burgdorferi can persist despite the type of treatment that was given to the patients in the Klevner study of human infection with post-treatment Lyme disease. So again, this raises the issue of whether that study was uh, adequate. And with this animal model disputing it, how we should approach the studies that were uh, done in humans looking at post-treatment Lyme disease. Uh, horses, what about horses? This is a horse that has some atrophy of its flank due to Lyme disease. And there has been evidence for persistent infection in horses five months after antibody treatment, tissues aseptically collected at necropsy from ponies with increased antibody levels after antibody treatment showed cultured positive Bergdorferi in various post-mortem tissues. And this is another uh, uh, a study from uh, Dr. Bartold showing they had two horses with very well-documented neurologic Lyme disease. Of course, the horses didn't complain of anything, but they weren't walking very well. Um, so, in summary, animal models of persistent Lyme disease uh, are, uh, are positive in gerbils, hamsters, mice, dogs, monkeys, and horses. But what about humans? Well, it turns out there have been a number of studies in humans showing persistent infection uh, despite short course, two to four week treatment of antibiotics. And those are shown on this slide. They're from a study that we published a couple of years ago. Uh, in all of these studies, there was persistent infection. Most of them, many were from Europe, but some were from the US. And the tissues examined were variable, but they all suggest that you can have persistent infection and failure of treatment with um, short course therapy. Uh, and this is just a, a, a survey of some of these studies. Um, one of them was, my favorite is the last one, where they found Borrelia in an iris biopsy, which is of a treated patient. Um, but there are other studies showing the same kind of persistence. So if you, get, if you have persistent infection, um, does longer antibiotic therapy help? And so to answer that question, we have to look at the literature. And let's see if I. Oops. <laughs> go backwards. So there have been some uncontrolled studies of longer treatment in uh, Lyme disease patients who have persistent symptoms. Probably the best of these was the one by Sam Danta, who had 277 patients. And he showed that with two months of treatment, this is kind of a little bit like what Dr. Murakami was talking about, with two months of treatment, you get a 33% improvement, but with three months of treatment, you get a 61% improvement. So even though this is an uncontrolled study, it does suggest that longer treatment may be beneficial in these patients. And then there were the controlled studies of Lyme disease that are cited in the IDSA guidelines as evidence that these, this type of treatment does not work. However, each of these studies has significant problems, and I don't really have time to go into them, but I'll show you one uh, one slide from a recent article by Brian Fallon from Columbia looking at just one scale, the fatigue scale, in these studies. And what this shows is that patients who had fatigue and were given antibiotics had significant improvement compared to placebo. So at least on this one scale, the fatigue severity scale, there was significant improvement with prolonged treatment. And even though there was a placebo effect that was significant overall in these patients, if you look at specific scales, the patients who were treated did much better than controls. So what about long-term treatment? I mean, isn't that really dangerous? And this is a statement from Henry Baser, who is the former president of IDSA, um, saying that uh, long-term antibiotic therapy may be dangerous, leading to potentially fatal infections in the bloodstream as a result of intravenous treatment. Well, the interesting, the interesting thing about this statement is that there are a number of diseases for which the IDSA actually recommends prolonged treatment. And some of them are shown on this slide. They're not all anti in intravenous antibiotic treatment, but some of them are. Some of them are combined therapy. And as you can see, the length of treatment varies from six to nine months, up to my favorite, which is alveolar echinococcosis, which we don't see very much uh, in, in North America, but 
the mean treatment there was 5.7 years with antibiotics. And even with that treatment, about 15% of those patients relapsed. So in a number of patients, it's perfectly OK and safe to give prolonged antibiotic treatment, but obviously not in Lyme disease. So we did a study looking at safety of prolonged intravenous antibiotic therapy in chronic Lyme disease. We had 200 patients who were enrolled in a home care company study. The average length of treatment was 118 days, representing 23,654 days with an intravascular device. And in this cohort, seven patients had an allergic reaction, um, and two patients had gallbladder toxicity. Um, complications related to the intravascular device were seen in 7.5% of patients. None of these were fatal. And if you compare this to the complication rate with these other studies, the control trials, our study came in somewhere in the middle, 1.0 complication per 1,000 IVT days. That's how this is usually reported. The Fallon study and Krupp study had slightly higher rates. The Klemper study was better. They took really good care of the patients. Um, but so it doesn't really look like this, there's a problem, a huge problem with safety of this type of prolonged treatment. Now, what about the benefit of prolonged treatment? This was a second study, a companion study that was done on patients um, who were divided according to how long their treatment was, from one to four weeks to up to 25 to 52 weeks. And just to, and four symptom outcomes were looked at, fatigue, cognition, myalgias, and arthralgias. And just to show you what this looks like, cognition is the most important one. And literally, it took up to 25 to 52 weeks to start seeing an improvement in cognition. So what this means is that patient with, patients with neurologic disease who get intravenous antibiotic therapy may require 25 to 52 weeks to obtain significant symptomatic improvement. So six to 12 months of IV antibiotic therapy to see improvement. Not two weeks, not four weeks, not even three months, but six to 12 months. And my colleagues in ILETS have seen this repeatedly in patients with neurologic disease. It takes a long time to get them better. And the only thing that stands in the way is insurance companies saying, oh, that's too long, can't do it. So uh, you saw this slide before. I would say a word about co-infections. You saw this slide too. There are a number of co-infections found in ticks. Uh, Babesia, Anaplasma, and Ehrlichia are the ones that are best known. Bartonella is kind of the, the, the emerging uh, king of co-infections. Rickettsia, another very important co-infection that's seen more commonly in ticks. Some of these other ones are, are interesting, but not very uh, common. Um, and even the IDSA admits that if somebody comes back and follow up and has symptoms that have persisted or symptoms that have gotten worse, it may be because they're co-infected and you have treated Borrelia, but you haven't treated the Babesia or the Ehrlichia. And in fact, there is evidence in the literature that Ehrlichia co-infection exacerbates Lyme disease. And there's also evidence in the literature that Babesia co-infection exacerbates Lyme disease. So it's really important to find out if a patient has a co-infection with one of these organisms. And also, it was previously thought that these co-infections were mostly acute. They caused acute disease. And because the, what was reported in the literature were patients who were immunocompromised and got these infections and died. But it turns out that most of these co-infections do cause chronic persistent disease. And so they can accompany chronic Lyme disease in causing the symptoms that we see in these patients. Now, one thing I want to, I want to say one word about Bartonella, because this is a study from New Jersey from a number of years ago where they looked at the infection rate in Ixodes ticks in New Jersey, and they found that 33% of them were infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the high level that you would expect in New Jersey. But interestingly, more ticks, 34.5%, were co-infected with Bartonella. So there are more ticks that carried Bartonella than Borrelia, which means that Bartonella may become a significant problem in this and other parts of, of the world. And you did, I don't know if we saw this, uh, I guess I showed this before. This is the co-infection rate in a study from Canada, where up to 66% of, um, uh, of, uh, of the ticks were co-infected with, oh, actually these were humans, weren't they? So 66% of humans had co-infection with these agents. So again, this is a significant problem that has not been addressed. So in conclusion, Lyme disease and co-infections are spreading. Borrelia burgdorferi is difficult to eradicate. 
Lyme testing is not as sensitive as we were told. I didn't really have time to go into that, but let's take a look in the folder. Lyme treatment failure is more common than we think, and prolonged antibiotic therapy appears to be relatively safe and clinically beneficial in persistent Lyme disease. I think I'll stop there. Oh, well, let me show you two more slides. I showed, I gave this talk to a bunch of residents lately, and I asked who the guy in the middle was. <laughs> Half of them didn't know. <laughs> so that makes me feel really old. So what about the prospects for a Lyme vaccine? We haven't, we haven't really heard it. <laughs> yeah, right. Ah, yes, the king. So there are a number of strategies now for Lyme vaccines and targets. However, with the bad experience that we've had with the, lung, with the one Lyme vaccine that was brought to market and then withdrawn, I think it's going to be very difficult to get a Lyme vaccine through, um, well, from, from a, a pharma company to get approval. So that's another problem. Thank you.